Hello, and welcome to the Scoliosis webinar. My name is Andrew Merget, a doctor of physical therapy, a board certified orthopedic clinical specialist, diplomate from the McKenzie Institute International, and a certified Schroth scoliosis therapist. I'm coming to you out of my clinic in Jacksonville, Florida at Take Control Physical Therapy. You can reach me for more information at info at takecontrolphysicaltherapy.com and or visiting our website at www.takecontrolpt.com. Okay, so I was certified in the Schroff method for scoliosis management in 2013, and I've done either a webinar or a presentation like this annually. And the reason for this is there needs to be more education to the public and for people that have scoliosis on treatment options and ultimately what is even the diagnosis of scoliosis. I either see two things. I see a lot of scoliosis patients that come to me and ask me about the Schroth method and they've tried lots of different things before and they're confused which one to try or the opposite, that they've just been diagnosed with scoliosis and there's a lot of confusion. They don't know what that means. They don't know what that means to their body and what's important is to provide an educational update annually and, and, and just to discuss the diagnosis and treatment options available and the evidence behind them. So some of the goals for this is to help understand people that are in pain when they're diagnosed with scoliosis. What does that mean? What type of treatment options are for them? Yeah. Awareness that there's evidence for treatment and that it's not just based on dogma or or old beliefs, um, but there's actually research that supports um, evidence-based practice for scoliosis. And it's no longer just a wait and see approach. You can be proactive with this with the right team support around you. And we'll discuss that in this lecture. We'll also make sure we go over the belief that there is something we can do to reduce or deceler decelerate the curve of a, somebody with scoliosis from progressing. So this presentation is for not only people that have scoliosis, but also healthcare providers that deal with it, or family members, or a neighbor, or someone that is a mother or parent, or a physician, to learn more about the Schroth method, and, and also to touch a base on some of the research that's on scoliosis in general. So to start, we gotta go back to the beginning. And wow, this year is the 100th year of the Schroth method being practiced. So it's not exactly a completely new method. It actually was founded in 1921 in Germany. And you'll see the picture in the PowerPoint here of Katharina and her daughter, Krista. And it was enhanced after um, a period of time in Germany uh, by her daughter who, who became a physiotherapist and the grandson Hans who became an orthopedic surgeon. At its earliest bout, the method was always a method more than a treatment protocol. And what does that mean? Well, a method is a reliable and thorough assessment. So the it's not just classifying someone's scoliosis based on the way they look on an x-ray but and their anatomy, but really to also understand what are their behaviors, their goals, their beliefs, their body image. How do they present themselves different than, than an, a group of another? So we want to do an individualized approach. And what you'll see here is Schroth at its earliest. The photo on the right is a therapist that's Schroth um, intensive, working with a patient using mi the mirror as visual cues and working on pelvic corrections for someone with a right thoracic curvature. And this person then is going back into a group. And you'll see in the picture on the left, a group intensive photo where people are, are sitting in the, in, on the ground and, and doing their corrections. And you have a therapist going around correcting each other. But each curvature and each person is treated like an individual with this method. And there's no longer a necessary that you have to just wait and see or, or be at the mercy of a, of a, of a follow-up. Yeah, there's more things you can do about this. But before we go any further with the history, we need to define as an audience and as a participant of this presentation, scoliosis itself. And what does it mean to be diagnosed with scoliosis? And how is it defined? Well, scoliosis itself, as defined by the Scoliosis Research Society, is defined as a lateral curvature of the spine greater than or equal to 10 degrees of a Cobb angle. 
That's the measurement of the S part of the curve of the C part. And it has to also include rotation for it to be defined as a structural scoliosis. What's the difference between structural and functional scoliosis? Well, a structural scoliosis is when someone bends forwards, they have rotation, they have the Cobb angle measured, meaning the S or the C part of the curve, but, but, but it's structurally based. It's a three-dimensional um, change in their, in, their, in their structure, in their skeleton. Whereas a functional scoliosis it could be somebody that suddenly has um, sciatica and they go to pick up something and now they're crooked or they're shifted. Okay? And when they're stuck, we call that acute scoliosis. And there's treatment for that. Certainly we do provide that. Um, but that's treated differently than someone that's structural. And in the lecture, we primarily focused on structural scoliosis. For more information about acute scoliosis that's developed from a recent onset of pain that doesn't have rotation, um, feel free to contact me um, or, or contact someone that's knowledgeable at, at the Schroth listing of schrothptsinus.com or visit us at takecontrolpt.com as we do provide telehealth services. Okay. So if we're going to talk about structural scoliosis. Let's talk about that 80, 90% of that is still idiopathic, meaning there's no known cause. So they found that there's some genetic links and they're trying to do a lot of genetic research, not on just the cause of it, but how to predict when someone that's younger or someone that's adult, how that they're going to, is their curve going to progress and, and what ways we can understand that. Yeah. Sometimes that's even more important than, than, than the cause of it. But, but if we can't figure that out, how can we manage people and identify people that need management at the right stage and get it to them? And another 10, 20% is outside that group is what we call neuromuscular or congenital, meaning they're born with it. So, so that could be someone that has a traumatic brain injury or, or a change in their nervous system that causes their body to contract to one side. Yeah. But for the most part, we deal with the idiopathic. And so to back into the definition of scoliosis, so what a Cobb angle is, you'll see the picture to the right shows a scoliosis curve. And in that curve, you'll see there's a measurement. And they look at the upper border of the superior vertebrae, vertebrae being the bones that make up our spine. And they look at the lower border of the inferior vertebrae, the area at the end of the curve where it starts turning into the other direction. Then they draw lines and they take a measurement there. That measurement, when you're doing an x-ray, has about a five-degree measurement error based on the different machines and different positions of the patient and, and, and modifications that way. So when we talk about progression in a moment, we're talking about more than five degrees at any one measurement from compared to one side to the next. And that's important for parents and um, people diagnosed with scoliosis that they can be misinformed if their curvature is increased or decreased by two degrees, that we would really consider that the same in that measurement. Adult scoliosis. So for a moment, this we'll talk about adult scoliosis and the two types. Adult scoliosis occurs a long time after skeletal maturity. So this is someone that has skeletal matured, they're not growing anymore, and they've had a previous curvature and maybe it's stabilized and it's starting to restart, or it's a start of a new progression. Some people manage their curvatures poorly and they, they don't know, and they were maybe never diagnosed. And their curvature could be progressing. And we don't know if it really restarted, but they would be into this group. And then there's the degenerative scoliosis. This starts in a postmenopausal period, accompanied with low back pain. Maybe this person has osteoporosis that's created a fracture or lateral listhesis or instability. Listhesis meaning a slippage of the vertebrae uh, from a softening or changing of the bone or a fracture. Yep. And that can cause a curve to restart. But that's a little different than someone that's had a curvature that's restarted or a progression that's up from a curvature that's already been stable. So the prevalence of scoliosis, it increases with age. So we find that it's about 0.3 to 0.5% in juveniles, 2 to 4% in teens, 9% in people over the age of 40, and as high in some studies as 30% in people over the age of 60, especially in female groups. And, and why is that? Is, is that because we talked about there's this adult scoliosis that can be caused from a degenerative change, as well as curvatures can be forming, um, it seems, in adulthood for females in a natural way. Um, what is important to identify when we eventually talk about pain here is that pain itself is not a 
scoliosis itself is not a risk factor for having to have pain. They did a really good systematic review um, about 10 or 15 years ago where they took all the possible risk factors that can be associated with low back pain and scoliosis and leg length discrepancy were not among them. Now, this doesn't mean that people that have scoliosis cannot have pain due to their scoliosis. But low back pain in general is just so common, as well as neck pain and shoulder and shoulder blade pain, that to live on this planet is to feel that. And so why I think this is useful um, information for us is, and for somebody that's dealing with scoliosis, is that you can have scoliosis and not be in pain. In fact, many patients that I see have pain that's more um, mechanical in nature and not structural. So what does mechanical mean? Well, it's something that varies. They have good days and bad days. They're sitting for a while and they go to get up and they feel stiff. But as they walk, they actually feel better as they move. Well, that's something that's going to be able to be changed more rapidly. And be really simple posture and position can reduce it. Or the structural patient where they don't have variability or there's no posture and position that can rapidly change it. But we use the Schroth method to be able to correct their posture in a more symmetrical position to decrease compression and elongation in their spine. Yeah. So again, it's an individualized approach that you need to take here. And not every curvature and not every pain presentation is the same. Why? Because it's a three-dimensional deformity. So we see pictures here. That you, you see on the right, there's an X-ray that shows the typical S curvature, the Cobb angles that are developed. And then you see the picture all the way to the left that related onto someone's actual body. But that's not it. We talked about rotation. So rotation, we see when someone bends forward. A test that, that you might have seen used is maybe when someone's younger, a nurse or a pediatrician or gym class, they have you bend forward and they measure your back and they're looking for rotation of the ribs or rotation of the actual bone, the vertebrae in your spine, the lower back or up higher. And so we can use that to identify when someone should be getting an x-ray, as well as um, the most structural change in scoliosis is typically in rotation. And that can correlate to how large a curvature can be or how much risk can be for progression. Here's another example of, of the Adams forward bend test when someone's bending forward. And you can see the rotation on the left side of this patient's body. We also understand that there's another plane of movement, the profile. And some people come in with me without a lateral or frontal plane deviation, and they just have a kyphosis. Sherman's disease or, or, or ky increased kyphosis is something that we can also treat with the Schroth method or conservative treatment. And some of these patients have pain, some don't. You know? And so there's the, it's all about measuring, again, the individual. But it's important to understand that when you go to see someone that's trained with this. And that's what I recommend. Someone has experience in training, classifying different structural abnormalities of the spine that they are going to look at it in 3D. And that's why previous exercises where you're just twisting and rotating or bending from one side to the other, yeah, that can just feed into the other curve or you can be moving in an area that you actually have more motion in. So it's important you go to a certified therapist. If you're not near one or you're not sure, look on an online listing or reach out to me and, um, I'll be able to direct you to someone that is qualified in your area. So uh, the effect of rotation has a huge effect on the vital capacity, meaning the ability to take a breath in and breathe out. You'll see in the picture to the left, a typical scoliosis breathing pattern for someone that has a right thoracic curvature, a common pattern because the heart is on the left side. So the right thoracic, meaning the middle part of your back, typically when people develop curvatures, it can be to the side of the heart, but typically it's away from it. And you'll see the arrows. It actually helps you to breathe into your concavity, okay? Oh, excuse me, your convexity, which is furthering rotation and furthering the curvature in your spine. So one thing that would be a, an important part about scoliosis care would be corrective breathing, elongating your spine from a, a top, from a bottom to top approach, and bring your body in a position where you can breathe into areas that are normally uh, uh, fixed and concave and, 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 and expanding those areas that, that need expansion. Okay, and you do that in a three-dimensional way. So where we, we arrive at treatment is, and what we want to discuss is the vicious cycle. Yeah. Usually there's an unknown triggering event. It could be caused from for an adult from, from a fracture, or it could be caused from, from a neurological change. But for most, it's an unknown triggering event. 
and it creates an asymmetrical loading. This loading then creates further deformity. This deformity, when large enough, can cause progression. And this progression can cause further spinal curvature. And without someone being educated on how to put their body in a more balanced position and breathe into a more symmetrical positioning, um, this can lead to this vicious cycle. So how do we change this? Well, you can see the, the picture on the right on the slide, someone that sits in their scoliosis posture and then a correction in their daily routine where they're going to be sitting in a more balanced symmetrical posture. I work with a lot of kids and I'll tell them it's like an eclipse or like Lego blocks. We're trying to bring them together so they stack in line. Versus we're not trying to bend down to one side or compress. We're trying to get taller, like a fountain coming out of the ground or a tree coming out from its roots. Definition of progression of scoliosis is an increase in more than five degrees between any successive x-rays within one year. And this circular progression of scoliosis has the most impact during the growth spurt. Progression by age. This is where the numbers matter and the age matters too as well. So this is talking about adolescence at this time. But then we'll talk about how this can relate to adults. Well, you can see a curvature at less than 20 degrees that someone that is age range 10 to 12 that's a female. Well, that's at a 25% progression risk. When that curvature, if it stays less than 20 at age 13 to 15, 10%. Over 16, 0%. We see as we get to a curvature above 30 degrees on the Cobb angle that the chance of progression is very high at 90%. And at that stage, any curvature right now above 25 degrees, we really would be recommending bracing and a, and a scoliosis trough intensive treatment plan for them. And they need to be monitored regularly to, to monitor progression and the effect of, of the, the treatment. Okay. But the wait and see approach is, is no longer validated. And, and this, this, these numbers are constantly changing as the Schroth method in the United States itself, even though it's been around for a hundred years, has not been something that has been around here because there just wasn't training sites and certification sites. Um, my, my myself was not certified in 2013 and I was the first one, of the first 50 therapists in the U.S. certified in the Schroth method. But now it certainly has expanded. There's multiple schools um, in, in multiple areas um, and, and, and training that's now available that's, that's much easier. Um, so more people can then be certified and, and providing this treatment accurately and reliably. Curvature by gender. Probably one of the most common questions I get is, okay, so why do girls seem to have it more than guys? Well, it's because a girl they go through puberty at an earlier stage of their segmental and trunk development than a male. And so what you'll see is that a curvature for a female that's 10 degrees or 15 degrees or 20 degrees when they're 10 or 11 is different than a male because they're going to go through a growth spurt later on and they'll be segmentally more stable and their trunk will be have different musculature than a, than a female that's in maybe more juvenile state. Okay, so what we'll see is as more severe scoliosis um, comes up, which means curvature is above 40, 50 degrees, then the, the ratio from male to female becomes female to male to at 10 to 1. And this is the reasoning behind it. So progression. Okay. In the slide we looked at before, a key number was 30 degrees. Even when someone's done growing and their skeleton mature, it has been well documented, as well as my own clinical experience, is that a curvature greater than 30 degrees, even to skeletal maturity, can still progress and needs to be monitored. And this is something that maybe I've seen a lot of patients 30, 40 years ago when they were diagnosed, they weren't told this information. They might have been told, okay, you're done growing, you don't need your brace, or, or you know, you're done growing, you don't need surgery, so your curvature, just you're good. Well, listen, we don't want this to be a gargoyle on someone's back they have to really you know, think about all the time, but it's something that'd be important that someone's at risk of progression and then they not, the progression is not linked to pain, that they can be progressing and, and not knowing it, okay? Um, so, so what we find is that the information for indications for treatment and interventions are that basically an adolescent with idiopathic scoliosis is anything less than 10 degrees, we would say we would still observe as a recommendation this time, but it's a case-by-case -case basis. But the, remember we said earlier on, the diagnosis of scoliosis isn't made 
unless there is a curvature and a Cobb angle um, greater than 10 degrees with rotation. So greater than 10 degrees and then 15 to 20 degrees is when we talk about possible bracing and Schroth PT. Now bracing is an individualized approach because it would depend on the age range of the patient and the risk of progression. But when we start getting over 20 or 25 degrees, it's important that we look at and validate bracing. Yeah, and the bracing hasn't really improved at this time. Um, and there's a lot of research on that. This webinar, again, is meant to focus a little bit more on my scope of practice, which is diagnosing scoliosis in a way that is treated conservatively through physical therapy means. But we think of an, the best approach, the team approach. And the re wood rego should brace, or the WCR brace, um, it is right now the, the best brace that, that, that's out there based on evidence and the effectiveness because it affects rotation. However, the Boston brace has also been shown and validated that it is effective compared to wait and see. In fact, a study that they did was they compared people with scoliosis that was above 25 degrees and 30 degrees and just waiting and seeing and people in the Boston brace. And what they found was that they had to stop the study because it wasn't going to pass ethics because people were so significantly increasing their curvature in the, the wait and see and control group that, they, that, that it was wrong for them to not be embracing. You couldn't reverse that. You can't go through adolescent development again. So it's important to emphasize that, that it's, it's not a one size fits all approach. Embracing and even surgery is necessary for the right patient if it's the right indications. Okay. You can do everything right and still possibly have an outcome of surgery. But, but it's always important to put yourself in the best position. It's not only really focused on just a number. It's about educating the team around you. Yep. Your healthcare providers, an orthotist, a physical therapist, a parent, a social support group like the Curvy Girls and helping other members um, and, and, that have scoliosis and girls feeling like they didn't invent this, you know, and they're not alone. So, so a real team approach is really important here. And that's what's important to focus on for indications for intervention. Not any one provider making one singular uh, recommendation. So here we go again. This Venn diagram, really important. Pain posture progression. Like we said before, having scoliosis and having pain does not mean that you have to have scoliosis and have pain. Many patients will come to me, have pain, and very quickly, we can see a rapid change in improvement, especially on people that have good and bad days and things that are more based on positioning and movement. But if you have pain and you have progression, well, the Schroth method is perfect because the Schroth method to do it to help you with your pain or help you with your posture and create symmetry, it will also help you with reducing progression at a certain um, frequency. Okay, and and so so basically, I see patients that that either have posture and progression issues. I see patients that have pain and posture issues, and maybe not at risk of progression. And I have, I see people that can have all three. So the goals of Schroth therapy, or Schroth therapy as it's pronounced in Germany, is to have a positive change in the signs and symptoms of scoliosis, to educate the family and the team, and the patient as an individual on not only their, their anatomy and their structure and correcting it in 3D, but on their belief system and on their way that they view their body and things that they can do to help that. And of course, if they're at risk of progression, we're looking to reduce that, whether it's an adult or an adolescent or an adult that has gone through adolescence and they have a curvature greater than 30 degrees and it still needs to be monitored or it's actually actually still progressing. We want to improve their cardiorespiratory dysfunction. One of the things that was very validated in the literature on the Schroth method and evidence was that they found that vital capacity, changing the three-dimensional breathing so that people and patients can breathe more into their concavities and not further rotate more into their convexities or their curvature um, it was, was a significant change, certainly reducing pain and understanding how pain affects them. Pain is always going to be a multifactorial experience. And just labeling someone having scoliosis and putting them in a box that that's, well, that's why they have their pain. It's always going to be an investigation. And if you see somebody for pain, you should feel confident that they're making things make sense to you. They're educating why you would do certain things and they're doing one thing at a time. So if somebody's giving you six or seven different things to do at once and then you feel the same or you feel worse, how do you even know what does that? Well, a good therapist is someone that's going to listen. They're going to listen to your beliefs. They're going to classify you as an individual, and they're going to put you in a pattern that makes sense to you. And that's something that you can do away from the therapist to get better.
Yeah. Most of my patients will see me somewhere between 10 to 12 and sometimes 15 visits to get independent in the program. But the goal is independence. So you're looking to improve mobility and posture stability, but not lying on a table and being passive. Someone just mobilizing, massaging you. Yeah, that's great if that feels better, but you want to stay better and you want to treat the source of these problems. And that's by education on a program that can bring symmetry without needing to see someone. Okay, Minimizing dependence and passive treatment for independence and, and empowerment, taking control. Okay. So some more evidence on the Schroth method before we go into specifics. Well, in 2018, there was a um, review and a, meaning a meta-analysis that looked at different evidence on things that Schroth has a statistical significant positive effect for. And they found that Cobb angle, body symmetry, the angle of trunk rotation measured by the Adams forward bend test, strength of the back, strength of the trunk, chest expansion, pulmonary function, were all statistically significant outcomes that were measured by patients that were instructed by a therapist in a clinic and doing it for at least one month at a time or longer. Then in 2017, a randomized controlled trial was done. Yep. And even more have, have been done since this time. But this was the first of its type to actually show that a patient in a control group that wasn't doing Schroth, that was at risk of scoliosis progression, greater than 20 degrees. They found that those that did just bracing and waiting to see versus people that did bracing, waiting to see in the Schroth method, that there was a 40% chance and more that the curvature would be halted or reduced or stopped in its progression compared to a control group that didn't do the Schroth method. And that's compelling. That means there is something you can do besides just being passively pushed there by a brace. Is an active exercise. But the reason why other types of therapy, physical therapy, isn't recommended because they take your curvature and they keep you maybe strengthening in the position you're already in. They're not actually making you straighter. And sometimes they could actually be bending you to make one curve on the bottom or top larger by just bending one side or the other. It needs to be three-dimensional and it needs to account, account for all the blocks that are affecting your body, including your hip, your back, your shoulders, and, and your ribs. So how do we arrive at an effective classification? As we've been hammering, classification is key and important. So what you're going to be looking for is you're going to be looking for not only the x-ray to discuss with the, the client and the patient and the family, but you're going to be looking at the rotation to help us to understand and help the patient understand why that's important. And then we're going to classify. You know, you see in the slide here, this is an older um, picture from the Schroth Method handbook that was developed you know, over 20, 30 years ago. We don't typically use the word rib hump anymore. We use prominence, okay? But we do talk about things and we do label things. And this is never to, to identify there's something wrong with your body. In fact, if you're going through a good scoliosis practitioner, they should identify to you that, that it's not that there's, there's, there's anything wrong with your body. It's just we're identifying areas that you need to open and elongate and strengthen and expand to create more symmetry in your body, to bring everything together. So we'll talk about things like as a weak side or weak point. Because instead of using the word concavity, because a concavity is experienced in multiple positions, both in the side and in the front. And so, so this is how we'll name it. You'll notice that this patient has a right curvature on the thoracic spine. You can see it on the part that does label rib hump. And you'll, you'll see then a lumbar prominence, and then you'll see a prominent hip to the left as a result of the curvature to the right. But there's multiple aspects to the curve, and that's the important part. So we look at the body in blocks. You'll see the picture on the left. So that's like an eclipse where everything's lined up. And then you see the picture to the right. It doesn't just fit into that model. You'll see that there's a three-dimensional rotation to these blocks. So if a curvature is on the right, that means that they're, that they, they're rotated to the right in that area. Same with the left. Okay. So the purpose of this lecture is not to identify or diagnose anyone specifically that's listening. It's to give them education. And the education has to be that the curvatures are different for different people. There's someone on the left with no scoliosis. There's someone on the right with four curvatures affecting the pelvis, the lumbar spine, the thoracic region of your ribs, and your shoulder block of your body. Then there's some people that just, just have single curvatures. You'll see that in the, in the N3 and N4 classifications here. Okay, and, and, and so what's important is not to look at this and try to diagnose yourself. It's to understand the 
intricacies of a method that doesn't take a generalized, let's just throw everything at the wall approach. The Schroth method is a classification system first to accurately prescribe treatment. Then from there, you can, we, you can see in this picture, this is a picture of someone doing a scoliosis Schroth exercise. You can see how they're elongating their head. That you can see how the little C's or the green shapes are the areas of their concavities, their weak point and weak side. And they're bringing them together. And you see how that right foot knee is bent? Well, for a lumbar curvature, the muscles of the front of our hip attach to the side of our spine. And when we correct the spine in 3D by breathing and, and elongation, we can then use that muscle in a different orientation to pull the curvature rotationally and side to side to straighten your spine. And that's how we can use it. We use the origin insertion in your body in a different way. And then we can challenge it. We can use the bar. We can use a physio ball. Okay, and then eliminate the need for rolls or bean bags to, to help us. You can also see here the same exercise on someone on their side, but two different curve types. The picture on the top shows someone that has a roll underneath their left part of their lower back. Yet the picture on the bottom shows a, a roll of pressure underneath their hip. It's because one person has a curvature for their back and one person needs to focus on the curvature in their, their thoracic spine on the right side. Okay, again, depends on the individual. You see here someone standing with their pelvis out to the left, and that's that's something that needs to be corrected and educated on. That's why you go see a therapist, and they'll, they'll talk to you about the corrections in sitting as well as especially in standing. So we start from, from the pelvis to come up. You'll, you'll see, though, during the exercise, this patient is correcting their curvature in 3D. Yep. So, so that's the goal. You know, you, here again, self-elongation, deflection of the curvature, derotation. These are terms that – that we would use to help you explain your body. And a good trough therapist will help you explain it in different ways. Some people are more visual learners. Some people are video learners. Some people require hands-on cues. And some people can even learn this through telehealth and virtual means by showing, taking pictures and, and helping them. Um, I'm certified to treat physical therapy in Georgia, South Carolina, New Jersey, New York, and, and, and Utah. And, and as a result, um, patients that are started on their plan, if, if they can follow up with me through a telehealth medium, and then we follow up in person as as needed for sure too as well. But 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 what's important to identify is look at the correction that we can apply. Yeah. You, there's there's an active approach that you can do here. Here's a patient of mine that I treated in 2019 after 10 months of the Schroth treatment. Now, not every single individual can get this type of correction, but it can show the impact we can have. And even if your curvature stays the same or it progresses, but you've done Schroth to control the curvature itself, you can look and see other videos on my, in, on my Instagram or my YouTube page that talks about success stories of just keeping the curvature where it is. That can be success. But what's really great and impactful about this is this is the only evidence that's out there in my own clinical experience that I know of that can actually do this. And these x-ray images are images of someone outside of a brace after they've been wearing. And actually the first picture and the second follow-up that you see, it says January 2019 and then 6, 2019. This was the effect of just the shroth and the Rigo Chanel brace wasn't applied to actually um, one month after that, that, that image. And then certainly in October 2019, we see the curvature being straight. And these x-rays again are taken um, after being outside the brace for 48 hours. Um, and, and this just shows the impact of, of, of what we can have here, okay? So ultimately, we're teaching posture. We're teaching the patient a, their habitual posture, which goes back into that vicious cycle we were discussing before. We teach them to learn to avoid it. So that's how we're breaking that pattern up. We talked earlier, how can we affect this? Well, we can affect this in their daily routine, and then we can affect this in a corrected posture. Okay, The corrected posture is specific exercises that look to reverse the curvature and hold them there. Typically, patients that are at risk of progression need to do these exercises daily, okay? And the best research, the best results I've seen is someone that's doing this on most days of the week for at least a minimum of 20 minutes a day. However, those that are just in pain and not at risk of progression may not need to do it. And again, it's based on the individual. They may not need to do it as often. But what's what's out there is that there's an answer here, okay? There's no dead end because we're teaching you how to diagnose a specific problem and how to treat it. 
And, and I, I've treated patients between the ages of nine and 10 and up to the patients um, in their A's and 90s. And there's always a way to understand something you can do. And if you can't do it, you'll, you'll be able to know because it's an assessment first. Okay, so so we're teaching posture. We're teaching how do you go away from a habit posture to a conscious posture that you could transfer into your daily routine and daily life. And we're teaching corrected posture that you would do a certain amount of day so that there's not the large amount of day that you're just staying in one posture position that creates and furthers progression or imbalance in your body. In conclusion, scoliosis patients need to have information about the diagnosis in order to help be, develop proactive approaches. That you just you have to have education. And I'm happy that this hopefully can give some more education. Yep. Find a practitioner near you that can educate you and listen to you and make it make sense. It should be a network. It shouldn't be competing ideas. And it shouldn't be just throwing things on the um, at the wall. There's great doctors out there and physiotherapists out there, especially looking for someone certified with the Shroth Method. You need to see someone that's certified um, and if you're not sure, there's listings listed. If you're, if that's still, you're unsure, you know, certainly reach out to me at takecontrolphysiotherapy.com at our Jacksonville, Florida clinic. Okay. And, and orthotists, parents, social support groups, the curvy girls group or support groups that, that are books. Um, uh, curvy girls have released a book um, about uh, taking control of your back, you know, and, and, and annual, um, scoliosis awareness months are huge, huge there. And I can't, I can't be more of a bigger support of, of people needing that and needing to know they're not alone. Okay. So, um, certainly curvy girls is a great group to go for Same thing with bracing, um, hopes closet. Yeah. None of these groups I'm affiliated with, but they're a great resource for parents and, and patients looking for, um, clothing that goes over bracing. Okay. Um, find what you need. Yep, and, and if you're not sure, just please reach out at the comments below or, or, or uh, reaching out to me. Um, I'd be happy to help anyone I can with this condition. Okay, so at this time, if there is any further questions or answers, I'm going to take a question and answer session. If you're watching this through replay on YouTube, um, you know, reach out if you need to. Again, info at takecontrolphysiotherapy.com um, and, and I wish you the best. Okay. Everybody who has scoliosis deserves a proper education and understanding of this condition. And um, thank you for joining uh, me on this lecture today. And I, I look forward to um, um, the feedback and responses I get from this. Best of luck. Bye.